Many people who have a profound interest in classical and jazz music often relish in the theoretical complexity of these genres. To them it is viewed as something far superior to run-of-the-mill pop or folk music, and while this might be the case, it can lead people who get into classical or jazz music, either as performers or composers, to engage in what I believe is a deeply flawed thesis about complexity. In this video I would like to focus on composition, since it is my area of expertise. However, this flawed set of beliefs does present itself in equal measure with many classical and jazz musicians. The detrimental frame of mind, or thesis, although not necessarily openly discussed, often dilutes down to the following. A complex composition can only become complex if the foundational ideas of the piece are complex. We see this kind of approach with many contemporary composers who choose to base pieces off of complex structural ideas instead of letting those complexities arise from an idea that might seem simple. It is easy to see this obsession manifested in the myriad of YouTube videos that outline obscure musical principles, be it irrational time signatures, microtonalism, negative harmony, polyrhythms, odd meters, etc. You can refer to Adam Neely's or David Bruce's YouTube channel for some of these topics, and while yes, they are interesting, I fear young composers can get carried away with these things to the point where the whole driving force behind a piece they are writing is merely to showcase one or more of these obscure principles or expanded techniques. The creative process might go something like this. Oh wow, microtonalism is interesting and unique. I'm going to write a piece that heavily uses microtonality. It's a complicated principle to grasp, so thus my piece will be revered for its complexity. The problem, however, is that when you start with something complex as your foundation, the music can only be developed with even more complexity. I feel a great poster child for this over-obsession with complexity is Jacob Collier. And, and so there, there's just so many interesting harmonies you can get when you start to use microtones in, in, in music. You know, you, you don't have to, wow. but it's good to know how... While Jacob Collier is no doubt talented, his compositions are far less compelling to me. His whole persona seems to revolve around a curated image of being a master of complicated and obscure musical principles, which he never ceases in explaining. For all his hyperactive interviews explaining concepts like negative harmony or what he calls super ultra hyper mega meta modes or whatever, the proof is in the pudding of his output shall I say. Besides his own compositions, his covers of songs display a profound disconnect from the source material, as the song becomes so mired in a hyper convoluted reharmonization that it loses contact with what the character of the song was in the first place. He doesn't seem to serve the songs he covers in a tasteful way, but rather as a way to showcase how developed his theory chops are. In the interviews I have seen with Collier, he only ever seems to discuss theory, and the more complicated the principles, the more excited and neurotic he becomes. Never is there a mention of structure, storytelling, narrative, form, and so on. And this shows in his own compositions. Which just seem to jump from one idea to another, without ever diving deeper into each section or developing any one idea further. They're just one, doesn't this sound cool and complicated section lined up after another with no relation to each other. I feel his compositions are like a bunch of miniatures lined up instead of one coherent piece. However, this is not a phenomenon I'd attribute only to Collier. In fact, what a music friend and colleague of mine once referred to as collage compositions is fairly widespread in the composition community at the moment. In my opinion, the most difficult part of composition is editing yourself. It's far more difficult to take one or two simple ideas or motifs and build that into a compelling 10 minute work than it is to string 15 disparate ideas together. Not to say you can't write a series of miniatures for the purpose of experimentation, but I still think a singular or multi-movement work needs an overarching structure and direction. But let's get back to the topic of this video before I get sidetracked on Jacob Collier, as he isn't alone when it comes to what I consider to be detrimental trends in the realm of composition. This is not to say I am against complexity or experimenting, however, you should have a clear idea what you are trying to achieve. It is better to write something that will be admired for its beauty as opposed to its complexity. And this really shouldn't be a provocative statement, as beauty has been the main aim of creating art for most of history. When listening to pieces of classical music, especially works written before the mid-20th century, I doubt very few people's first reaction upon listening to a certain piece would be, wow, this is complex and heady stuff. But yet this is the paradox of classical music. Classical music is incredibly complex but yet most good compositions don't, at a surface level, sound overly complicated. They do, however, 
provoke complex thoughts and nuanced emotional responses from the listener. It achieves this, oftentimes, in a very abstract manner. How is it that something just called a symphony or concerto can elicit so many different emotional responses? This is often where the complexity of modern classical music fails, as it bashes you over the head with its complexity, and doesn't let you delve further into your own thoughts. It's already mired in so much complexity that your brain has fewer avenues of interpretation to follow. Achieving beauty in music depends on more factors than merely a mastery of complex music theory. I'd even say one of the true components of a good composition is developing complexity out of simplicity. I know it's an overused example, but think how simple the main motif to Beethoven's fifth is, but yet how much complexity arises out of that simple motif. Of course this does not remove the need for applying obscure and complex music theory principles when you feel they are needed. Perhaps you do find a moment where a polyrhythm or an exotic mode is the best course of action, but it should be in service of a greater narrative. Something I often tell my students is that you need to start with a simple foundation before writing a piece. Build a chord progression, take a simple form, and build off of that. An analogy would be the foundation to a great cathedral. Most cathedrals are built on a somewhat simple cross-shaped foundation. However, what is built on top is where most of the astounding complexity is found. However, all the ornamentation, spires, buttresses, steeples, still need that foundation to be achievable. Although perhaps simple in its form, these foundations enable mind-boggling complexity. The resulting cathedral inspires awe and wonder and is cherished for generations, which is in a way what this simple change in one's thought process achieves. Oftentimes you'll stumble across the argument amongst postmodernists that archaic forms and theory principles are too limiting, predictable, simplistic, or even kitschy, and thus stifle creativity and innovation. In my opinion, this is wildly incorrect, as basic tried and true foundational forms enable enormous amounts of creativity, all the while serving a greater narrative. But let's stick with architecture for a second and compare these two cathedral floor plans. On the left is the Gothic masterpiece that is the Chartres Cathedral, one of the landmark Gothic cathedrals in France. But what about this somewhat similar floor plan to the right? It could very well be the starting plan for another traditional Gothic cathedral but as traditional as the foreplan and foundation might look, it is actually the foundation to the Sagrada Familia by the famous Catalan modernist Gaudi. On this floor plan, Gaudi was able to create the plans to one of the most unique cathedrals of the 20th century by employing modernism, neo-gothic, and art nouveau into one incredibly inspired design. We can somewhat see the same thing happen in music, where something like the sonata form is used by composers from Haydn all the way to Shostakovich. The sonata form is not overly complex in its structure, but yet it enables enormous amounts of creativity and thereafter ample room for complexity. Therefore, I think complexity as a starting point ultimately leads to less compelling art, be it in music, painting, or architecture. Complexity must follow simplicity, as only then can complexity arise and transcend complexity for the sake of complexity. So much modern architecture, art, and music suffers from this dilemma. But let's stick with the cathedral example and ask ourselves what might happen when an architect dispenses with the traditional standard cathedral floor plan and goes for something somewhat more complex and different, like this floor plan for the Clifton Cathedral in Bristol, England. Instead of a simple cross, this architect opts for an irregular hexagon. The foundation is no longer simple, nor does it follow the historical or cultural narrative of what defines a cathedral. And, well, the resulting structure is just kind of hideous, to put it lightly. In music, this manifests in ideas like 12-tone serialism, where the basic idea, while compelling and complex, mostly achieves bland, inhuman, emotionless, and unlistenable quote-unquote music. The foundational framework of the 12-tone system is, for the most part, too complicated and rigid, and thus enables far fewer roots for a composer to expand upon than, say, a simple tonal chord progression could. Ironically, you could probably take a simple chord progression and, with some tweaking, turn it into something complexly atonal. But you could also develop that progression in an infinite number of ways, which is the point I'm getting at. A composer like Alban Berg adopted the 12-tone system, but underpinned it with the quote-unquote simple framework of tonality, and due to this, Berg is, in my opinion, one of the few atonal composers to achieve beauty with his compositions. To sidetrack somewhat, in science it is often simple ideas that led to great discoveries, 
Let's consider some examples, such as the falling apple that supposedly led Newton to start thinking about gravity, or the Ouroboros, which is the ancient symbol of a serpent eating its own tail, that gave the German chemist Kekulé the idea for the circular structure of benzene. And finally, Einstein's musings about whether a window cleaner he observed would feel their own weight if they fell, thus leading to his principle of equivalence, a foundational idea to his general theory of relativity. So although I have not explicitly kept the arguments in this video purely on the topic of music, I think the point I am making should be coming across. Start simple, and then, and only then, can you delve into further complexity. One of the most difficult forms in classical music is the fugue. What enables an effective fugue is actually just a simple subject. The more complicated a subject is, the harder a fugue becomes to write, and the less musically coherent and enjoyable for the audience the result ultimately is. Bach understood this, as his fugues almost always begin with fairly simple subjects. However, the resulting fugue is astoundingly complex. Simplicity, as a starting point, can only grow, as it enables infinite options on how to proceed. On the other hand, complexity as a starting point only limits and restricts further steps. A good set of theme and variations will display this, as the initial theme is fairly simple and even childlike, but with each variation a master composer can develop the essence of the initial theme into something astoundingly complex. Basically, if the initial progression, harmonic structure, or rhythm of your piece is so overly complicated that the story of your piece of music is harder to tell and develop, the outcome will be even harder for the audience to understand. Let's put it this way. You can't start with the theory of relativity if you never considered the simple thought of whether someone falling might feel their own weight. Creativity can't be taught, nor can it be measured. However, we can recognize some of the essential thought patterns of creative minds, and the most successful and cherished among them seem to start simple and build from there. So that's the moral of this video. You must be able to work with simple techniques before you can graduate on to more complicated ones, and even when you become well-versed in the complexities of music, a wise composer will discover a simple foundation to a piece is usually the best at enabling further complexity, which in turn doesn't advertise itself as being complex for the sake of being complex and fulfills the innate human desire for beauty. That's why I say it's better to write something complexly beautiful than beautifully complex.